Hi, welcome to this lecture on symmetric key cryptography. So you may recall that symmetric key or secret key cryptography is a cryptographic technique where both parties in the communication share the same key. So in the example we did in a previous lecture, we have Alice taking her plain text and encrypting it with a secret key and getting out her ciphertext. And then Bob takes that same ciphertext and he decrypts it with the same secret key. So those two keys are the same. And he gets out the original plain text that Alice encrypted. So that's basically how symmetric key cryptography works. There are two types of symmetric key cryptography, stream ciphers and block ciphers. And we're going to talk about both of those in this lecture. So stream ciphers are a type of symmetric key crypto. And they use a fixed length key to produce what's called a pseudo random stream of bits. And what that means is you put in a fixed length key and this algorithm just produces a string of ones and zeros, seemingly random. But anytime you use the same key into the algorithm, you get out that same stream of ones and zeros. And then in order to encrypt or decrypt, you just use the exclusive or operator to exclusive or those bits with your plain text in order to encrypt. And you exclusive or those same bits in order to decrypt. So it works the same way either way. Whether you're encrypting or decrypting, you're just exclusive oring your message with the bits from the bit stream. The goal of a stream cipher is to approximate a one-time pad. So when we discussed a one-time pad, I mentioned that it was the only provably secure form of cryptography, which is where your key is just as long as your message. Well, a stream cipher has the goal to approximate that. But instead of using a key that's as long as a message, you use a much smaller key, and then that key is used to generate a very, very, very long stream of bits. So let's look at some two real-world stream ciphers. The first is called RC4. Uh, RC4 was a stream cipher that's most famously used in WEP, the wireless equivalent protocol, or wired equivalent protocol for wireless network security. Uh, it's also an option in TLS or HTTPS for encrypting web traffic. But it's not recommended for use anymore. It has some mathematical weaknesses that mean it's, it's not suitable for quite a few applications. Another real-world stream cipher is A51. And this is used for encrypting GSM phone data and conversations. And so it's used to encrypt data before your phone sends it wirelessly to the, to the, to the operator. Uh, the NSA is known to routinely break um, A51. This was released as part of the Snowden leaks. So again, it's another stream cipher that's not really recommended for, for usage. So let's do a stream cipher encryption example. So let's say we have some plain text data that we want to encrypt. And we have a key that we're going to use. In this case, I'll just make it 128 bits. We take that key and we feed it into our stream cipher, which in this case is RC4. And that causes RC4 to produce key stream which is a potentially infinitely long string of ones and zeros, but we produce enough key stream so that we have the same length of key stream as we do plain text data. And then we exclusive or those two things together in order to get our ciphertext. So the key stream exclusive or with the plain text gets me the ciphertext. So I could write that as ciphertext equals the key stream exclusive or with the plain text. Well, how do I decrypt? Decryption is very similar, except in this case I have ciphertext that I want to decrypt, and I take that same key that was used to encrypt it, I put the key into RC4, I get out the same key stream that the person who encrypted got, and when I exclusive or the key stream and the ciphertext together, I get the plain text. Another way to write that would be to simply say that plain text equals key stream exclusive or with ciphertext. So let's look at that a little bit more about how we use exclusive or with a stream cipher. Now when we use exclusive or for encryption, we see that the ciphertext equals the plain text exclusive or with the key stream, which is just what we went over. When we use it for decryption, the plain text equals the ciphertext exclusive or with the key stream. So basically, whether you're encrypting or decrypting, you simply take the message you're working with and you exclusive or it with the key stream, and that performs the encryption or the decryption operation. Let's look at an example. So if I'm going to do an encryption, and my plain text is here, 0110, and my key stream is 1101, I'm going to exclusive or them together to get the ciphertext. 
Now, in case you're not familiar with exclusive OR or you've forgotten because it's been a long time since you looked at it, here's the truth table for exclusive OR. And what this shows is that you know, if we exclusive OR 1 together with 1, we get 0. 1 exclusive OR with 0 is 1. 0 exclusive OR with 1 is 1. And 0 exclusive OR with 0 is 0. It's just the truth table for exclusive OR. So if I look here and I see that the plain text is 0, 1, 1, 0, the key string is 1, 1, 0, 1, when I do the exclusive OR, I'm just going to do it bitwise. So 0 exclusive OR with 1 is 1. 1 exclusive OR with 1 is 0. So I have 1, I have 0. 1 exclusive OR with 0 is 1, and 0 exclusive OR with 0 is 0. So my ciphertext is 1, 0, 1, 0. If I go to decrypt then, so if I decrypt that ciphertext using the exact same key stream, then I'm just going to exclusive OR those together again. So 1 exclusive OR with 1 is 0. 0 exclusive OR with 1 is 1. 1 exclusive OR with 0 is 1. And 0 exclusive OR with 0 is 0. So I get that result to be 0, 1, 1, 0. And they match. So you can see up here that the original plain text I started with matches the plain text I get at the end when I decrypt. So I encrypt by exclusive oring with the key stream and I decrypt by exclusive oring with that same key stream. So that was stream ciphers. Now we also want to look at something called block ciphers. Now block ciphers are another type of symmetric key crypto and what they do is they use a fixed length key to encrypt a fixed length block of data. So a stream cipher generated key stream and you exclusive oring that together a block cipher encrypts specific blocks, fixed length chunks of data, into, the, into an, a ciphertext of the exact same length. So for example, a 64-bit block of data and a 128-bit key could be the parameters for a block cipher. So I could have a block cipher where my key is 128 bits and I encrypt 64 bits of data at a time. Now at its core, a block cipher is in some ways very similar to a substitution cipher, but with a much larger alphabet. So remember in a substitution cipher, we simply had every letter written out as one entry in a table, and then we randomly permuted the entries so that the, so that the encrypted version was just a randomized list of the alphabet. So that meant that every letter in the plain text had a one-to-one -one correspondence with a letter in the ciphertext. Well, the block cipher is basically the same thing except our alphabet size is a lot bigger. Instead of it just being 26 letters, it's every possible, say, 64-bit value. So if we were to do a 64-bit block cipher, that would mean that our substitution table would have 2 to the 64 entries, which is 1.8 times 10 to the 19. That's a huge number. Uh, that would be a really big substitution table. In fact, it would be 125 million terabytes. <laughs> So it's huge. So I don't give this example to say that this is how a block cipher works. It doesn't build an actual table, but the idea is the same in concept. Every 64 bits of plain text would have a corresponding ciphertext for a given key. So my goal of a block cipher is to do this same thing, but do it with an algorithm and a small key instead of building up an enormous table. So some real world block ciphers, we'll go over two of them. The first is the data encryption standard, DES. Uh, DES is a, was a U.S. government standard until 2001. Uh, it was released in 1976, and it uses a 64-bit block size and a 56-bit key size. So the key was 56 bits, but the blocks of data that you encrypt are 64 bits. Now, a DES was replaced by AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, uh, and AES uses a 128-bit block size, and it can take a variety of key sizes, either 128, 192, or 256 bits for the key size. AES is the current US government standard, and it's, it's probably the most widely used symmetric key algorithm in, in most applications today, and it's considered very secure. Lots of smart people have looked at it, and they haven't found any significant weaknesses. Let's do a simplified AES example. So in this case, my encryption, I take some plain text data of, of, a, of one block size. So if we're doing AES, that block size is 128 bits. I take a key, which is 256 bits for AES here, and I run it through the AES encryption algorithm. So the key and the data go in together, and that produces ciphertext data of 128 bits. 
So my plain text block is converted to a ciphertext block of the same size. And when I decrypt, I do the same thing in reverse. I put my ciphertext and the key into the AES decryption algorithm, and I get out the plain text data. Now it's really important to note a couple of things here. First is that the block size is really important. You can't use a block cipher to encrypt something that's smaller or larger than the block size. You can only encrypt an item that is exactly that size. So if your item is smaller than, in this case, 128 bits, you would need to break it up into pieces and encrypt each piece separately. If your item is bigger than the block size, in this case 128 bits, then you would need to break it up into smaller pieces and encrypt each 128-bit piece separately. If your item is smaller than 128 bits, then you need to add some junk. We call it padding. Just add some extra bits to get it up to the right size. Because a block cipher only encrypts chunks of data that are the right size blocks. So let's look at some properties of block ciphers. Now one important property is that the plain text to ciphertext mappings must be one to one for a given key. So that means that for a given key, the same plain text block always becomes the same ciphertext block, and the same ciphertext block always becomes the same plain text block, so vice versa. It's also really important that the input and output have no correlation. So what this means is if I have a 128-bit input block, that will produce an output block. If I change one bit of that input block, then the output block should change significantly in a way that's not distinguishable from random. And not distinguishable from random is just a big fancy way to say that about 50% of the bits should change. So if I change one bit on the input, then about 50% of the output bits should change. Let's look at some features of block ciphers. The first is the block size. In general, the bigger the block size, the more secure it is to an extent, but it's probably slower. Larger block sizes tend to be a little bit slower when you do the encryption and the decryption. And key size is the same. In general, bigger is more secure, but it's probably slower because it takes more computations to do the encryption. Okay, so let's summarize this discussion of block ciphers and stream ciphers. Stream ciphers are used to produce a pseudo-random stream of bits that you exclusive or with your plain text. So the stream cipher produces the stream of bits, your key stream, and you exclusive or that with your plain text to encrypt, or you exclusive or it with your cipher text to decrypt. Block ciphers are used to encrypt one data block or used to encrypt data one block at a time. So you put in one block of plain text, you get out one block of cipher text. And in all of the symmetric key ciphers that we've talked about today, the sender and receiver need to share the same key.